back on the right path, society would correct yeah, itself and we wouldn't fallen. be having all of these debates. Like, that's my oh, operating theory right now. Yep. Uh, you are good to go. Okay. Okay, guys, we are rolling into another episode of The Candace Owens Show, and today I would like to talk about social media censorship, sort of the rise of social media censorship. The operating theory is that they are censoring people that are white supremacists, and of course, who would disagree with that? If you're a white supremacist, I don't want to see you on the internet. If you're perpetuating white supremacy, it probably is a good thing not to allow you onto their platforms, but is that the truth? Um... I don't think it is because I've certainly uh, been suspended, although my accounts were restored and I don't think I fit the bill for a white supremacist. Here to talk to me, talk with me about all of this is Mr. Paul Joseph Watson. Welcome to the Candace Owen Show. Thanks for having me on, Candace. Good to be here. It's, it's good to have you here. I didn't think that we would ever get no, you Matt from in- as well. I yeah. feel a bit out of fish out of water right now. We were going to get you a map to make you feel more comfortable yeah. and at home talking to me. Yeah. But well, we decided I, not I to. I can do it. Right, exactly. So you recently got defended by the President of the United States mm, came out. It was out. nice, wasn't it? It was. A roaring defense of Paul Joseph Watson when he uh, was banned from Facebook and Instagram. Mm. Uh, it was... It, Actually, bizarrely, you knew you were going to get banned because somehow the media um, already knew you were yeah. going to be banned, which means that there's Facebook is speaking to the media before they even take actions, yeah. um, and they banned you. Now, I will tell you, I followed you on Instagram. You kind of just post selfies. They were all selfies, yeah. Yeah, it's not Hardly really anything else. <laughs> there's no very dangerous. My selfies, apparently. <laughs> right, I, I they followed... were good selfies as well. I was right. pissed, I'm more pissed off about that than Facebook. Right, so there was really no political post thoughts. Post my holiday snaps or anything now. Yeah, exactly, really... exactly. There was really no political thought on your Instagram page. Oh. It was a bunch of selfies, which is what all the girls are doing on Instagram. It's why you have so many followers. Maybe a few, ki a few kissy faces, and whoop, ban from Instagram. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? What was the reason that they gave you? The reason that they eventually gave was that I was banned from Facebook and by proxy Instagram, same company, obviously, because I had interviewed Tommy Robinson on my YouTube channel three years previously. Oh. So it was nothing to do with anything I posted. I, you know, everyone's been suspended for a week on Facebook over mm -hmm. the course of the past 10 years, but no direct violations of any of their policies. They came out in the media last week and said it was because I interviewed Tommy Robinson. So this is behavior on a completely different platform simply because he appeared on my channel. Now, Tommy Robinson has done interviews with BBC, Sky News, ITN, are their Facebook pages going to be wiped out? No. So it's this Orwellian dystopian idea that simply appearing, sometimes even in a photograph, people have had Facebook posts removed for simply Tommy Robinson appearing in a photograph with them. The idea that Mark Zuckerberg and his employees are monitoring your off-platform behavior, and then they can use guilt by association to designate this person as an extremist, and then by proxy, you're an extre extremist. So that's how it happens. So you can catch it, pretty much, is what they're saying. So if I yeah. have a dialogue yeah. with someone, um, and I and I and let's say I agree with somebody on anything, maybe, maybe Tommy Robinson says two plus two equals four, and I say, you know what, Tommy Robinson, I agree with you. That means I now co-sign everything else he's ever said and done. So yeah. what they're basically saying is even conversing, having a conversation with, retweeting, I've even seen. If you retweet someone um, that they deem to have, who, to have had an idea that they disagree with in the past, it could have been 14 years ago, mm. you can catch it, if yeah. you will, and that gives them the excuse to ban you from their platform. But if you're on the left, you can joke about raping children in 2012 on Twitter. Right. And that was just a joke, right? It's right. just a joke. Nothing happens Hoping that They weren't even joking. Joking when uh, we had one one actor who said that mm. he hoped that Baron Trump um, was Fonda, put yeah. yeah was put in Peter Fonda that's right was put into a, a cage and raped by pedophiles yeah. I believe is what he, he said the t I don't think he even removed the tweet either he didn't never remove the no tweet suspension, never nothing. issued an apology and was never his account was never suspended nothing no I mean it's it's absolutely unconscionable that the bigger threat for me though is not just deplatforming it's algorithmic manipulation I'll give you an example. Right now, on Google, you could search Paul Joseph Watson YouTube. What would you expect to come up as the top result? If I you know, you, how many followers my, do you on YouTube? You're, my it's YouTube like channel, 1.6 million, million subscribers. 1.6 million subscribers. You would expect the first result to be my YouTube channel. Correct. The first result is a person doing an impression of me who has about 200,000 subscribers, a video that has about 30,000 views. You don't even get to the result for my YouTube channel until the bottom of the page. 
Okay, so Sundar Pichai, however you say his name, testified in front of Congress they don't manipulate the algorithm for partisan purposes. Complete and utter lie. Of course, lie in front of Congress. You've got videos on YouTube. Mark Dice is another conservative commentator on YouTube. Uh, you can put in the exact title in quotations for a video that he produced a couple of years back about Michelle Obama, two million views or whatever. You have to go to page 30 on the search results of YouTube to find that exact video. Videos appear before that that are completely unrelated to Michelle Obama or anything to do with that. Oh, we can talk about Google manipulation. I mean, that's that's the most obvious thing. And the reason for this is simple. Uh, human beings are lazy. So when they go to Google, they want Google to spit out the fastest result. They probably don't even look past the first four things that it hits. The mm. first four links that come up when you Google something, you are more inclined to hit those. I can't think of the last time I've hit the second page of Google, right? So Google, Google understands this, obviously, human beings are lazy, they want information as fast as possible. So what they're purposely doing is giving you false information about someone or, or, or distorted information about someone. If you Google me, the stuff that comes up is hideous. I do so mm. much work for Black America talking about actual issues that are happening, like the illiteracy rates um, that, that people are going through. I testified in front of Congress, and yet nasty, disgusting articles that have been written about me by leftist, racist journalists mm. will be the first thing that come up. As if, and we know for a fact that CNN is not being watched. We know for a fact that their viewership is down, that people are no longer paying attention after they got caught with this Russian hoax. And yet all of their stuff will hit the top of the page every single time. And YouTube came out, let's bear in mind, YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world after Google itself. It's owned by Google, obviously. They came out and admitted, we promote authoritative search results above anything else on YouTube. What's authoritative? far left fringe websites like Vox, like Vice or whoever. Um, and they outlets. are extreme. In my opinion, those are the extremists. Like when you start yeah. talking about Vox media and the things that they say and they put down in writing. Completely. And, and now the, their behavior has gotten to the level where they scream all day. They complain about bullying and harassment and doxing. The prime progenitors of bullying, doxing and harassment are these fringe far left websites. The Daily Beast came after Pamela Geller's daughters who aren't even political. She's got a fatwa against her from Islamic terrorists. Her daughters aren't even political. They out her daughters, their profession, what they do, their identities in a hit piece. They're not even political. The Nancy Pelosi video that the guy uploaded to Facebook where she's slurring and it was a doctored video. Again, they, Daily Beast again, doxed him, identified him. The creator of the Trump wrestling meme, they doxed and identified him. They went to an old lady's house in Florida and accused her of running a Russian bot network. CNN cameras pointing at her house while they're intimidating her, harassing her. They are the prime progenitors of cyberbullying and harassment, even physically in person. And yet they use that excuse to get rid of us. Right. It's just the and, double and standard is amazing. To me, it's always been very clear what they're trying to do because the journalists are trying to wipe their hands clean when, when they say things that they know are false, right? And and unfortunately, in America, in American society, it is very hard to prove libel um, when you are a public figure. They can mm. basically say and do whatever they want, and it's 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 excruciating. You guys actually, in that regard, are much safer here in the UK. I've gone after the Guardian, the Independent. If they write something mm. about me, the burden is on them to prove it, that it's true. But over there, they can say anything they want. I've read articles um, basically calling me anti-black, saying that I'm pro-Hitler, saying, uh, I mean, it, the most absurd things, I'm a black, white supremacist, and there's no, there's, there's, they don't have to prove it, they don't have to prove it to be true, they can just simply write it as if it's a matter of, a, uh, it's, uh, as if it's a matter of fact, when in fact it's a matter of, not even an opinion, it's not even their just opinion, they just don't lies, like me. Yeah. But what are they doing? They are sanctioning then for leftist thugs to show up when I go somewhere and to uh, intimidate and to harass me mm. and to be violent towards me, and yet they say, well, I just wrote the article, I can wipe my hands clean of this. And there seems to be no protection. I mean, what what, what is the solution to this? Well, we, we had um, one possible solution with Senator Hawley introducing this bill, which would treat Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and Google as how they behave as publishers rather than platforms. Because Love that. Because if you threaten to take away that immunity, and what this bill does is they have to report to a commission in the US and prove that they're politically neutral and nonpartisan to maintain that immunity from lawsuits. So... If someone goes on Facebook and posts a death threat, obviously Facebook is not legally responsible for that. They would be if they behave like a publisher. If the New York Times published an article with a bunch of death threats against Donald Trump, the New York Times would be liable because they're a publisher. Right. But YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter are now behaving completely like publishers. Absolutely. Not only with their algorithms, but with the people who they ban, who almost entirely are on the right. And it's 
I called it election meddling, and it is. Listen, you had the Vox Party in Spain, which is a populist party, center-right populist party, got 10% of the vote, 24 seats in the Spanish parliament. Days before the election, Facebook banned numerous pages that supported the Vox Party that had millions of followers. Three days before a national election, that is election meddling. They just had their YouTube channel banned two days ago because three left-wing activists claimed that they'd violated copyright because they had some video with some political footage in it, which was used by all the other parties. Now their YouTube channel is gone too. That's election meddling. Well, here's my thing. I think their hope is that it's going to meddle with the election. I think they're doing it because, of course, they want to meddle with the election. And they think that Trump, the reason why Trump is in office is because there was this hole, right? There was this vacuous space. Mm. In the past, people used to accept whatever came out of their TV screens to be the truth, right? Before this rise of social media, yeah. um, we just had sort of two networks that were competing with different narratives. And we accepted everything they said to be true um, with without ever deeming to discover anything ourselves. But because we have now YouTube, it allows people like like me to say, hey, Black America, uh, why are we voting Democrat, right? It allows people like you to produce videos and show what's actually happening in countries mm. that we know the mainstream media is never going to cover because um, they, they want to protect their own narratives. And I think that they think that the reason Trump got into office is because they didn't manage the narrative, right? It was this whole, he got around them. They called him racist, sexist, misogynist, rapist, everything that they possibly could. And yet he managed to slip through the cracks because, aha, Twitter, aha, Facebook, mm. aha, we, we were kind of the troops that were getting out the truth and saying, no, 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 what CNN told you was a lie, what Fox News told you was a lie. So I think their hope is that they'll be able to stop this in 2020 if they get a whole, uh, you know, um, are able to get a hold on social media people that are so influential like you with 1.6 million followers. But I don't think that that's actually going to be the result. I don't think when you ban Paul Joseph Watson, his 1.6 million followers go, Okay, I guess I'm a liberal. Yeah. <laughs> Been watching him for like five years, but you know what? Yeah. I think he radicalized me. Woof! Yeah. I'm, I actually am just a no, liberal. It, it only makes them more encouraged to go out and vote, right? Right. I mean, that's what it does to me. Right. But it's it's absolutely incredible. You, going back to the media lying about you. I mean, have you read your own Wikipedia page? I've read my own Wikipedia page. It's like Woof. horrific. It's so bad. It's like you wake up every morning and... I don't do it every day. I'm not an egomaniac. But you, you Google your own name in Google News to see what the latest hit piece is. And it's just the complete 180 of the person who you are. So I read my own Wikipedia page and it's like alt-right conspiracy theorists. I'm not alt-right. The, pr the premier premise of the alt-right is a, a white ethno state. I don't believe in that. I've never believed in that. So I'm not alt-right. The alt-right hates me. They attack me. I mean, Google my name and 4chan and see what the alt-right thinks about me and you as well. It's the same thing. But with the with the Wikipedia thing, conspiracy theorists, okay? I hate conspiracy theories. I think most of them are really dumb. I, I, that's why because, I don't watch CNN, because they are a conspiracy theorist network. Yeah, I mean, talk I, about conspiracy because theories. Because I was a conspiracy theorist when I was a kid, like 15 years ago. Yeah. That's where I came from. So I know how those ideas, you take disparate bits of information and fuse them together to create a conspiracy. That doesn't mean that there aren't some conspiracies, but I know how they're created and I know mentally how people are lulled into believing them so now looking back on what i did in the past i know that most of them are dumb so for that to still be my defining characteristic yeah a conspiracy theorist even though i know i hate conspiracy theories is incredible it's like with you with the with the uh, social what was the uh, the social um uh, social autopsy social oh my god autopsy, that spun so crazy out funny, of control the first time i came across you and your name was writing a hit piece about you <laughs> right yeah that's right you did you, you wrote me something about me i think it's right 20, you, you thought i you thought i was right? a leftist yeah and that was actually back when i was more i was a liberal yeah. and what happened but, the liberals I, I saw what the liberals were firsthand yeah. that they were that they were sort of crazy and it made me more conservative but um, you, you believed things in the past which you've changed your mind on and you don't believe now that's fine. The left gets to do that all day well, long. How about with this? The, the CNN will be the first person to call somebody a conspiracy theorist. They have literally peddled for the last two years the biggest conspiracy, conspiracy theory, theory. The biggest political conspiracy theory that has ever existed. For the past two decades, yeah. by the way, WMD and the Russian collusion hoax. Russia, yeah, exactly. The, the Russian biggest, collusion. Two I mean, it's biggest, crazy. Most harmful. Talk about tin foil heads. It's just yeah. like, Vladimir Putin, Russian collusion, yeah. not a single shred of evidence. And even though it's now the, the person that was their hero, Robert Mueller, oh, he's coming for you, Trump, in five, four, comes out and says there's nothing here. What did they do? They double down on the conspiracy. Down. Even though and they, they say, oh, we need to wait to actually read the report. Then the report comes out. They read it. 
and they, there's nothing there. Yeah. So what do they do? They triple down on the conspiracy theory. And I'm like, guys, c- conspiracy theory network to me, the number one conspiracy theory network right now, which is actually driving America apart, is CNN. Completely. I mean, I mean, everything that they've said hasn't come to. They, they've been saying that if Trump got into office, think about all, all the things they said would happen if he got into yeah. office. No, that, and now it's concentration camps, right? Right, I mean, they're- We had CNN contributor on, on yesterday saying, yes, they're going to become death camps, okay? Again, going back to the conspiracy theory thing. When I was 18, 19, 20, I was putting out articles saying um, George W. Bush is going to set up FEMA camps and Americans are going to be mass incarcerated in FEMA camps. That was silly, okay? Now an elected member of Congress is saying basically the exact same thing, concentration camps. And everyone defends her and people get up on CNN and take it a step further with the hysteria saying, right. no, they're actually going to be death camps. And they actually don't want to talk about Obama's legacy in terms of these of uh, the, the migrants, the border. And, and yeah, it was his policy. It was right? his policy. It, it, actually, it was Bill Bill Clinton's policy. Mm. And Obama took it. I mean, he 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 arrested so many migrants. No, I mean, so many people that came from over the border. Nobody said a single thing. Nobody mm. cared. It was fine. No one. There was no investigative report. There was no outrage because the media accepted narrative was that everything was great because we had mm. a black guy in office. And people don't care to do a comparative analysis. And the idea that we shouldn't be allowed to have national sovereignty is, to me, absolute lunacy. It's like right now, what we're seeing happening on the left is that they they want to they want to see a breakdown of society simply to say, I told you so, because mm. the person that they didn't want to be in the Oval Office is sitting there. Yeah, and they're fanning the flames again for more riots if Trump gets re-elected, mm-hmm. which happened when he did get elected. They kind of brushed that under the carpet. I'm surprised that there haven't been more left-wing extremist attacks, actually. We had the James T. Hodgkinson shooting, which thankfully nobody died. Um, Steve Scalise almost died. We had and these all get buried immediately. There was a terrorist in, I think it was San Francisco, Pier 69, last Christmas. He planned a massacre of hundreds of people. You go on his Facebook page, it's all Antifa websites, it's CNN, it's the Young Turks. We get blamed when people who commit acts of violence watched an Infowars video. When somebody like this, who is clearly radicalized by this kind of extremist rhetoric that you talk about, goes out and plans to massacre hundreds of people, it's just it's it's barely well, even. Think a news about the item. shooting in um uh, Colorado recently. Mm. Half the, it was like the number one thing, and then it went away overnight when they realized that the shooter wasn't um conservative or, or Trump supporter. They realized that that, they, that it was leftist and wasn't. Is that the, the school transgender shooting? Yeah, the the, tra- yeah. the trans person. It was yeah. like, oh wait, this doesn't fit the narrative. Whereas mm. when the Parkland shooting happened, this went on for months and months and months. They turned the students that survived it into celebrities, and and the, the Colorado one didn't fit the narrative, and especially because which made me so happy. Those kids stood up and walked away and said, and refused to speak to reporters and said that they would not mm. allow the reporters to use their tragedy and manipulate their tragedy and emotions to, um, you know, try to rescind 2A, try to repeal 2A. And I thought that was like, that to me was a moment. That was kind of this moment which said that we have sort of inspired this awakening in terms of how the media does manipulate people. And I think that's largely in part due to alternative media people like me, like you, who are just kind of talking about real life here. Yeah, going back to the, is it going to impact the 2020 election, this deplatforming? What you don't have happening now, which you had in 2016, which you had, is posting a video on Facebook, for example, and it would get 10, 20, 25 million views. I remember doing one about, I think it was the um, some riots in Philadelphia, or no, it was Baltimore, I think. But yeah, Baltimore riots. The video got 20 million views on Facebook. Obviously, that's not going to happen now for me. But even if I was still on Facebook, there was a switch that occurred in late 2017, early 2018, where from getting 500,000 to a million views on an average video on Facebook, it would be cut down to 60, 70,000. So they deliberately made that switch. And it's, as you say, obviously most people in the Rust Belt weren't voting for Trump because they saw an edgy video of mine on YouTube. There were fundamental economic nationalist reasons for voting for Trump. But how big is that chunk that's been taken out of the energy behind his base, how big an impact is that going to have in 2020? That's why people have complained about 
the administration not taking enough action. Right. And I think Trump, that's the reason why Trump, when it got to you, because they, they always try to say that one person's so fringe, it doesn't matter. This person was crazy. That's why we got rid of them. And I think that that's what they did with Laura Loomer, right? Because they sort of went out early and they said, oh, she's a radical. And then what they do, like which is true of, le of leftists and fascists, is they move in, they move in, they move mm. in. And now they're calling Ben Shapiro alt-right. And he just can't believe he's being called alt-right. But this is what they do. They're going to censor any dissenting Maybe opinion. Maybe should have said more about Alex Jones when Alex Jones got banned. Right, I right. I mean, they, they claim that this is to solve radicalization. If you look at what some of the people who have been banned, Laura Luma for one, Milo Yiannopoulos for another, are now saying on Telegram, for example, they're saying stuff which is way more radical than they ever said in the past. So it doesn't stop radicalization. And it's only so going to make- On Telegram? Telegram, yeah. It's a- I know, I have, I have Telegram, but I use it for like messaging. Yeah, it's like a WhatsApp, but you can have a group on it um, uh, it's a Russian-owned app, so you're never going to get deplatformed, basically. They don't bow to the outrage mobs. Mm -hmm. But that is the only platform that they've got left now. So all bets are off, and the stuff that goes on on Telegram is is way more provocative than what you would ever see on Twitter. So deplatforming doesn't actually stop radicalization. I think it in increases radicalization because people have got these frustrations, and if they're not allowed to voice them and air them, mm -hmm. they're only going to be buried further underground and people are going to get more and more resentful. And that is, I think, what is happening with the rise of some of these right-wing attacks. Christchurch, for example, things like that. So right. it's only going to get worse. What I mean, what do you think? And you're not the only person that has this theory that when you start banning people who are just having a dissenting opinion, it actually, in fact, radicalizes them. Or I say the other way, where it, it forces them to be suicidal, because you basically say yeah. you can't participate in society. You're canceled. No. Cancel culture. I mean, a woman turned up at the YouTube headquarters and tried to kill people and ended up killing herself because right. they deleted her channel. Obviously, she was completely insane, but right. you are going to get people eventually who just start killing themselves because we've got a culture that's so based around narcissism and addiction to social media. The social media platforms created that environment, which is why Twitter is never going to remove retweets and likes. They talk about this. Oh, for the health of the conversation, for the, for the health of people getting getting themselves off social Brian media Stelter's addiction. Brian Stelter's interview with Jack Dorsey. Yeah. I mean, I lol Brian Stelter but, is such a joke. But they're not going to do that because it would prevent these outrage mobs building up enough enough momentum to deplatform um, people from PayPal, well, Twitter, and Facebook. Let's talk about the reason why they want to do that in the first place. So, and and for those of you that aren't following this, uh, so it's been proposed that Twitter should remove the ability to retweet, um, uh, and so you can't see you can't see how many retweets something has gotten or see how many likes something has gotten. To me, that was almost like saying they want to pretend that all of the ideas. You, so you, you would walk into this into this into Twitter and you would say, I don't know which idea has gotten further. The whole idea of a retweet and is to see how many people agree with this. So that whole idea of likes is to see, wow, 400,000 people liked what Donald Trump says. That that lets you know that Donald Trump is leading. But if you remove that and now you've got Hillary and Donald Trump, you don't know whose ideas mm. are, are, are going better. So it then allows you to sort of shape the narrative and pretend, oh, Hillary's leading by 15 points. I really do believe that's why they even have this conversation in the first place. Mm. Because these CNN journalists, they don't get any retweets. They have no following. And they feel pathetic. So they start demanding that Twitter takes away the fact that they have no power in America anymore. Yeah. So that they can pretend that they are these people that are like the guardians of thought in America. Mm. Like, they, And they're not. Nobody cares what they think mm. anymore. They're considered puny and pathetic and that they won't just let it go. They're considered angry and bitter. And, and incapable of just telling the truth. The truth is that Americans are not racist as a whole. The truth is that Americans are not sexist or misogynist as a whole. The truth is that we were dissatisfied with what was going on in our country. And you saw an ideological revolution take place in Donald Trump in the same way that it took place in the UK with the Brexit party in the same place that it's taking place in um, uh, with Bolsonaro in the same place that it's taking place with Salvini. When the people are dissatisfied, you are going to create this environment of populism. And that's what this is about. This censorship is about creating a false consensus. And it goes back to 2012, when big leftist websites and most mainstream news websites completely eliminated comment sections, because there were academic studies performed in those years, 2012, 2013, which proved that the reader judged the veracity and the credibility of the article, not on the content of the article, but on the responses in the comment section underneath. So as soon as- I those, do that. Yeah, I do I totally that. do that. But they don't really exist anymore on, on the big left-wing websites, right? They all got rid of the comment sections because they found out... I mean, BuzzFeed still has a comment section, which is a Facebook plugin, 
And whenever there's a hit piece about me or you or anyone, it's 90% in our favor. I'm surprised they haven't got rid of them. But most have because that sets the consensus. And that's the same thing with social media deplatforming. Oliver Darcy and Brian Stelter don't get too many retweets in comparison to Candace Owens, do they? Right. It's, it's pathetic, to and be so, honest. And, and what is it? it? It hurts their egos to admit yeah. that nobody's following them. But what I, what I struggle to understand is why not just start telling the truth? I mean, what would the truth what would is be, quite popular, isn't would, it? it? It turns out the truth is popular, <laughs> right? Known. And even even if it's not, some people just crave they crave just an authentic conversation half the time, right? So mm. as opposed to pretending everything's great, or just have a conversation, sit someone down, and say, "Who are you? What are you about? Why do you have a following?" Just being able to sit down they and hate communicate. The idea of that. They hate the idea. Just of it. for you to enunciate who you are as a person, what right. is your truth? They don't want you to have that ability because then that would take away they, their power to portray everyone as these dangerous right-wing bigots as they do. Which is what what it points to is the fact that at, at their core, they're narcissists. Completely, you know, but also very boring. They hate to look boring. at themselves. Like, have you seen people like Oliver Darcy on YouTube yeah. when he goes on a show? So boring. so boring. These people don't have personalities. That's why nobody wants to listen to them. So they get jealous. I mean, in his case, he was part of right-wing media. He was with The Blaze, right? And Who he, was? Oliver Darcy? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, and basically he, the... People around him, were, he didn't really do a good job, so they kicked him out. Then he joined CNN and had this vendetta. So he became like the activist. This for a year before Alex Jones got taken down, he was going to Facebook, he was going to YouTube saying, this violates your policy, this violates your policy. When are you going to remove him? Again, they're not journalists. They're almost uniform, uniformly they're activists. now activists. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're definitely activists. I mean, activists. just be honest about it. Like, I'm not a journalist. I'm a commentator. I have right. a position. I take a position. So do they. Me too. But they Me claim too. This not This is what to. I believe in. This is what I want, and what I stand for. I'm not here to pretend that, you know, like I, I saw this actually, that's really funny because um, now they try to say, oh, well, why, why don't you do a good job of trying to bring people, you know, bring people together, right? Like, I think that was actually might've been one of the questions that that British journalist, Andrew asked uh, Ben Shapiro. Mm. What was Andrew Neil, yeah. Andrew Neil. I, I always want to say Klein. Yeah, when Andrew Neil says, you know, your tweets don't align with this thesis in your book, right? If you're all about bringing the left and the right together, then why do you say things like blah, blah, blah? And the way that I would have answered that question is I'm not trying to marry the left oh, and yeah, the right. Completely. I think the ideas of the left are bad and rotten yeah. and that we have to de defeat them ideologically. I'm not trying to marry uh, no. communism. With <laughs> Pol politics should always be rigorous and divisive. It's right. just a fact because right. people are always going to have competing ideas. There's no way to make this marriage e happen yeah. and be successful. You have an even uh, playing field and the best argument wins. That's right. how it used to work. It's like now what people are trying to say, if you're not trying to bring together the communists with the capitalists, something's wrong. There's there's no way they can live in a house together, right? And they don't want to listen to you anyway. <laughs> no. That was on the far left. Obviously, no, of there course are some, not. They want there to are some centrists you. who will, but yeah. Yeah, they, they want to deplatform you immediately. I, that's not my job. My job is to make sure that I get these I, these ideas of free markets and capitalism in, into a community that I believe is is desperate for it, the, being the black it, community. They will never listen because it's in the DNA of the far left to, to not even listen to a conversation because they believe that gives you power for them to even listen to right. you. So that's never going to happen. This idea that we need to all come together in, in the spirit of love and all that's not politics. No, it's not you scrap politics. it out, that you have a level playing field, the best ideas win. That's exactly but right. Now they've they've upset the level playing field and that's the only way they can win because as you said, the truth is popular. Their deceit, their fake news conspiracy theory isn't. Okay, so then here's another thing that I wonder. What what is the purpose of these people that benefit so much off of a capitalist structure, being these these people like uh, you know, Don Lemon and Oliver Darcy and Brian Stelter, why are they giving socialism a platform that would negatively impact their lives, right? Ellen DeGeneres, try, you know, trying to make AOC seem friendly, whatever it is, they, they, they invite these guests on that are talking about things like socialism. I think AOC said she wants to tax anybody over 10 million. That's a lot of people on the left that are, are going to have to give up their money. I mean, what is the purpose of them pretending that this is a society that they want? Well, Either they've got very clever loopholes in how they pay their tax and a lot of their <laughs> investments are offshore, which is what the, the richer people do, or they don't believe that it's ever going to happen. Um, but, you know, you had Joe Biden come out in a speech to Wall Street billionaires and he literally said, don't worry, nothing's going to change when I win. And that is the top 1%. He said, your taxes might go up a little bit, but don't worry, nothing's going to change. So deep down, they probably think that that radicalism is never going to take hold in America. But if you look at the polls, especially amongst millennials, they're pretty keen on it. 
They're pretty keen on socialism. See, I don't I don't know that they are. See, my experience, and I say this as someone who has, has traveled and done a lot of speaking in front of in front of the youth, is that they're not. Generation Z is very conservative. Like mm. I'm, I'm serious. Generation Z, and and this might be because they are the YouTube generation, right? Yeah. Like they they are constantly in alter, alternative and looking at alternative um, forms of media. You know, we know people that watch Fox News are, are 60 plus, and people that watch CNN the same. So. Um, I, my sense and my feeling actually is that Generation Z, being the kids that are in high school right now, are surprisingly conservative. And this is sort of a response to the millennials who have just yeah. swung the pendulum so far left, my generation, um, swung the pendulum so far left that we're seeing sort of this op equal and opposite force because they're like, they're irreverent. They love, they're the meme culture. Completely, yeah. <laughs> they're the meme culture. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't really. I'm actually pretty hopeful after I go and I speak to these kids. They love being offensive. They love it. Oh, completely. If you look at TikTok, I mean, they even put out hit pieces about TikTok, which is an app basically for teenagers. But they were they were inserting their edgy Zuma humor into it, and then the vices and the voxes of the world started coming after TikTok. But yeah, there are polls that show that, and obviously you want to rebel against the establishment right. if you're a teenager. That's a part of being what a teenager. Is, what is the establishment now? Right. Like back in the 80s, it wasn't what it is now. Right. The dominant forces of culture, politics, and society are all controlled, academia are all, all controlled by the left. That's so, so if that so that's is the so establishment, what else can you rebel against that's but right. that? It's natural for kids that are young to want to rebel, right? Whatever it is, whether it's smoking yeah. cigarette, which is drinking alcohol before you're supposed to, um, saying words you know you're not supposed to, cursing, um, or in, in this case, it seems to be, okay, everyone's going to be a leftist and a liberal and upset and under a pussy hat, but we're going to be the exact yeah. opposite. I mean, look, think of the, the, the Covington kid, of my the MAGA, that's, that's what I'm talking about. These yeah. kids are much more MAGA the, on the streets. My, I see high my, schoolers walking around with MAGA hats and yeah. like, no, my YouTube demographic is 20 to 35. That's the biggest chunk by far. So it is that YouTube generation. And you, you, it was flipped back in the 70s, the 80s. The censorious powers in society were on the right. So kids, teenagers rebelled against that. Right. When the Sex Pistols tried to play a concert across the United Kingdom, it would get shut down. It would get banned because the people on the right, the religious right mainly, were the censorious crowd. And that's, that's why you had a an enlightenment period really in in the UK in terms of rock music, in terms of punk, and later on in terms of comedy, because the right and the religious right was still largely in control of those cultural institutions and of the entertainment industry. So it was cool and it was edgy. And it was subversive. Yeah, it was subversive. So if that's the opposite now, where it's the left that are the censorious ones. Political and, correctness. Yeah. You can't say that. That's offensive. Oh, you have to you have to apologize for your tweet you sent 20 years ago. Oh, you yeah, can't host the that's Oscars. That's not human behavior. Nobody right. acts like that in in a person-to-person -person situation. Even Bill Maher came out on CNN and said this a couple of weeks ago. Nobody is politically correct in private conversations. That doesn't mean that people are racist. They're just loose with their language because they want to have a laugh with right. their friends. They're not spouting hate speech or anything, but they don't want to watch their language around their own friends. That's I'm not so, a human thing. I mean, how lucky are we to have grown up without this ability of the internet to capture everything you said? Oh, I mean, God. and here I said so many stupid things, so many horrific things. You just experiment with being a horrible person when you're young. That's the whole like, point yeah. of growing up. Ooh, I'm not supposed to say that, so I'm definitely going to say it, right? So like, Completely, you get on the bus yeah. and bye, mom. At the bus station, you get on the bus and I was dropping f bombs and saying whatever I wanted, you know, whatever I wanted to because I wanted to be counter cultural culture, what, what was told, what was supposed to be okay, or what you're allowed to do, you always want to step outside of that as a kid. So in a weird way, and I think this is best evidenced by the fact that I've got 1.5 million followers on Twitter after only being here for under two years, you've got 1.6 million subscribers on YouTube. That's evidence for the fact as that, yeah, today, by the they time can, I get home, that might be gone. Right? <laughs> yeah. But so they can censor, they can, they can pretend it's not happening. But I'm largely optimistic that it's no matter what, the more that they censor, the more they try to suppress the truth, um, the greater this underground movement of thought and conversation is going to become. You could say that, you could make that argument for Zoomers, but in terms of millennials, if you ask them on campus and they've done lots of polls, what's more important, pol being politically correct or having free speech, the majority say being politically correct. So but that's different on campus, the whole different beast. I yeah. mean, that is why we call them islands of totalitarianism. Mm. It becomes the culture there. I mean, I think that the reason why I got lucky is because I dropped out of college. They couldn't indoctrinate me long enough. When you yeah. get these kids here so for, for four years and, and you t make force them, which is what they do, to take these classes like Feminism 101, African-American Studies, there's now gay studies, all of these things. 
Oh, even when I was going to college in um, 2000, 2001, history, they would put a huge picture of Stalin up on the wall and Lenin, and just we would have to worship that for a couple of hours. That's when I dropped out. No and that was like 18 way. years ago. Yeah, that was 18 years ago. I don't ago. believe it, this. It, it, was, it was pretty bad even back then. But yeah, this, this, you go back to saying we were lucky not to have everything on record on social media. This is the Chinese communist style social credit score system where over there, you cannot even buy a plane ticket or a train ticket in some circumstances because of what you've said online in that country about the government. In America, in the United Kingdom, maybe it's about a protected group. That is the next step. And now MasterCard shareholders are having a vote as to whether they can deny service to individuals based on their political beliefs, based on if enough people complain about it. You know, happening. I think my hope is with that when you're starting to see this sort of corporate corporatization of uh, of free speech uh, uh, being shut down, my hope is that free markets will take care of that, right? So if once these big companies start saying, yes, we accept this, my hope is that then conservatives will just stop using it. And what I mean by that is, like, I was horrified when I saw that Burger King sanctioned the milkshake trend mm. of, of throwing milkshakes at old people if they're conservative or, or at politicians like Nigel Farage and they're, you know, sanctioned it on Twitter by yeah. saying, you we have milkshakes all day for people, whatever mm. it is, which is basically a nod to political violence or the start of political violence. Um, my hope is that then that sends a signal to everybody that is conservative or, or supports the Brexit party or at least supports human decency, right, to not go buy a Burger King, not, not you it's, know, not go eat a Burger King. Though, because when, when Nike had the whole Colin Kaepernick thing they ended up making money off that because the virtue signal guarantees them millions of dollars worth of free advertising, which they would otherwise have to pay for. So in some instances it works because you get enough liberals who will buy that product. With the Gillette thing, um, the best an incel can get, you know, their, their whole ad campaign about um, woke progressive shaving. <laughs> People have switched over to other companies, but they lost money. So in some instances it works because obviously Gillette's mainly a male audience, but with Nike they actually ended up making money from the whole Colin Kaepernick thing. So I, I don't... would like to see that long term though. Mm. Long term, right? of... instantly it can be pretty volatile, right? So yeah. you can get one really virtue signaling billionaire yeah. to just be like, oh, "I'll just buy all of this just because just to prove a point that they're not going to stop you." But I'd like to see that that long. In term. terms of free market, I don't think we've got an answer to. I mean, YouTube. They just control too much. There's no real YouTube alternative. There's BitChute, but then you can get a BitChute and a Gab, and you're just in the ghetto with the actual white supremacists. Right. Because that, that is a lot of it. I mean, let's be honest about mm -hmm. it. You go on Bit. Obviously, if I only had BitChute as a platform, I would have to use it, and I do. But you can go on the front page of BitChute, and yes, there is literal like white supremacist propaganda on there. So they need to get way better at that. The the good example is Parler. Oh yeah, Parler's great. I don't know what happened with that. I think, was it the Saudi thing where all the Saudis who were being banned on Twitter came over? Because I went from like 6,000 followers a few weeks ago. Now it's like 40,000. There's been a huge onrush of uh, participants in Parler. And that does look like it will be a kind of balanced platform. I really do think so. And I've met, I have met I met the founder. I was mm. one of the first people who said, like, hey, I'm going to try this out. And I think it's a responsibility of those of us who have a platform, still have a platform, to experiment with alternative platforms. And yes, there are some of them that I think are too extreme and I've never um, given my voice behind it. But I think Parler is, is an excellent one. And look, I'll still keep my Twitter account, right? But I'm saying that I'm on both now. So if, if you think that banning, I think you know, and all of these conservative voices, I'm going to stay here? No. And I think the greatest thing that could happen would be for the president of the United States to jump ship. Because you know what would happen yeah. after 2020 if he won and then jump ship to alternative platforms? Everyone would have to follow him because he's the president of the United States. do some posts on alternative platforms. Right. I totally agree with that. Yeah. That would be a big move. But do, do you ever fear being banned? Because they came pretty close with Crowder. People like, oh, no, Crowder? Surely not Crowder. He was on the edge. He was hanging right. by the skin of his teeth. Are you ever concerned that you'd get banned? I've, I've already been banned and then, on, you know, sort of unbanned. I think, no, the reason why I'm not concerned is because I create a weird problem for them. So as I said in the beginning of this, this episode, the whole idea of them banning people is that they say it's white supremacy. Well, when you start banning black people, even the people mm. that might be believing in this white supremacy lie are going to start thinking. And the last thing the left wants is for people to start thinking and to start realizing that what they're doing is not banning white supremacists. It's them outwardly being fascist yeah. and, setting, and shutting down any dissenting opinion. So I force that conversation naturally. Um, which is why they always admit to their error immediately and reinstate my account. Um, and, you know, I, what, what, 
everything that I say is on record. Black people don't have to be Democrats. I'm a black conservative. I think, um, you know, that that liberals have done a tremendous disservice to black Americans. And I don't plan on shutting up about that. And because of my following and uh, sort of the publicity that's behind me, it just- but Don't you think Adolf Hitler was good, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> right? The, ridic the ridiculous stuff. I mean, they've really tried that everything. That'll be on your Wikipedia forever right. as well. Here I am it? at Prager U, right? Dennis Prager, <laughs> who is Jewish. <laughs> Um, but this is, I mean, they're, this is the desperate, they're trying on the outskirts to try to launch, you know, some sort of mud that will actually stick on me. It yeah. hasn't worked. Um, and I am protected by the color of my skin. So how's that for maybe some black privilege, right? Yeah. <laughs> Use their own identity politics against, against them. them right? So it's, but it, you've it been scary. criticized for, but I'm totally on board with that as they go for it. Yeah. I mean, but that's the whole thing. It's like, make you, make you. You made the bed line it. You yeah. said that you cannot critique a black person. You cannot critique a woman. A woman. Oh, you, now you don't like to play by your own rules. Mm. And 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 it exposed them. I like for them to be nasty and to critique me because it exposes them for what they are. It was never about protecting minorities. It was never about protecting women. It's about gaining power. And the proof. I am proof. I'm living proof of that. Which is why I never have sympathy. Obviously, you can still support free speech, but not have sympathy when people on the left get banned. Because well, this is the bed you made, lying it. Right. Like when the Krasensteins got banned. I mean, that was just funny. Obviously, <laughs> but I, the difference is, you and I would never lobby to for get anyone them, any on the left to be never banned. Done that, ever. I mean, first of all, what a waste of time and how pathetic would your life have to be to be that hyper-focused on getting somebody else silenced. Right. I mean, that speaks fundamentally to... The, the constitution of these people on the left. Ideological weakness. Their ideas can't win. So yeah. what they do, shut down other ideas. It's also in the marketplace of, a... of ideas, they can't win. So it's basically saying, my product sucks, so I'm going to get the other get rid of the other product that's competing with my product that's going to mm. get sold, right? That's what they're doing. It's also a kind of self-loathing thing. Though. I've noticed this. Many of the people, especially in the UK, who would viciously come for me, especially in a couple of years back, you would read into them and they would be deeply depressed and they would write about how deeply depressed they were and how self-loathing they were. So there is an element of that on the left that these people just are very unhappy people. I agree with and that. And they lash out and they think that by rerouting their unhappiness into political activism, then that, then that suddenly gives them the moral high ground. It doesn't. It means you've got personality issues and you need to sort them out. They're dark. I mean, look, these people are dark. They're they're um, they're bitter. They're angry. They're upset. Their lives aren't going the way that they should go. I mean, this is the example that I constantly gave about this, this radicalized feminism. Look who who were the radicalized feminists. Most nobody of them are thinks ugly too. nobody <laughs> thinks Kathy Griffin's happy. Nobody can look me in the face and tell me they think Chelsea Handler's happy. No one could say any of that with a straight face. But these people bought into the scam of leftism in their youth, right? And now they're they're alone because they're, a lot of them had a vendetta against society, like. The classic stereotype of feminists being fat and ugly with multicolored hair. Then you get this is what a feminism looks like campaign with actors and attractive actresses coming out. Emma no, Rata, whatever. Yeah, but no, generally the stereotype is true. I mean, right. generally people who have a resentment against society because when they grew up, they didn't have maybe as many opportunities or as much fun as other people did because, you know, they weren't as attractive then that's the hand you dealt. Deal with it. Right. Just deal with it. Deal with the hand you dealt. But a lot of it is based on resentment, I find, because these people are unhappy and in many cases physically repulsive. Right. <laughs> right. And I, I look, you know, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to say it I'm not a feminist. It sounds quite soft moric, but no. I think it's just generally true. Yeah, no, it is generally true. And, 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 and like I said, even if you challenge someone that's on the far left to give you a straight answer, do you think Kathy Griffin is happy? They will say no, oh. right? And so that should tell you something. So this person is not outraged about Trump. There's something else going on, and Trump becomes the yeah. front for yeah. their own misery and how, their own outrage and their own upset. How many times can you say orange man bad without I, getting bored? <laughs> no. It's like Bernie Sanders had a tweet the other day, the racist, sexist, homophobe. Yeah, all right, where's your platform? Orange man bad is still their platform. Right, I know, I know. And, and I, what I always wonder is, how do they do it every day, right? So even if you, it's like being upset every single day. I get day bored of talking about the same thing. They I know, never do. They That's never their get advantage. bored. It's just like, how do you not so get boring. bored of talking about Trump? I get, you, you got to get bored of this obsession. There's a media worldwide obsession with everything he says, every mannerism, every cough, every yeah. sneeze. And I, I think that they, they are bored. If I'm being honest, I think they are bored. I think they're miserable. I've made videos about subjects though, and then the subject comes up again, like the border issue or whatever with the t detention of children. Okay, I made a video about it, but then it comes up again and I'm like, well, I've said everything I want to say about that. Right. I don't want to revisit it because I get bored of talking about the same thing. Pe a lot of people on the left never do. It's like a kind of personality trait 
but also an advantage politically because it has come back with the same drumbeat over and over again. If he wins again in 2020, do you think they will stop? Do you think we'll see sort of them trying to normalize? Self-realization. Well, no, I, I, don't th I don't think I would never put it under the category of self-realization. I would actually put it under the category of, okay, now there's nothing we can do. Let's get ready to try to pretend that, that, that we're normal and sane for 2024. <laughs> I think the Trump derangement syndrome has toned down a bit over the past year. I mean, 20, you know what I think? 2017, 2018, though, they were literally screaming to the sky. Remember that? <laughs> That's true. I mean, they've toned it down a little. Or maybe it's just that I'm not as interested in it. Because right. I was, I would always combat it with my own rhetoric. Now I just Im hashtag impeach Trump now. Like literally every week it trends on Twitter and I just roll my eyes. So do you think that's because I'm just not into it? Or do you think the TDS is as bad as ever? I think it's transition. So it went from like, we're screaming at the sky to like, okay, we're in this. We can, Russia has colluded and he's going to be gone in two years. So now we can just focus on Russia, 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 Russia yeah. obsession. So I think they just sort of move the goalpost. Um, but I do not think it's calmed down. I don't think really? you can, I don't think you can watch TV and not see something about um, Trump and how the world is ending I mean, maybe because I of just him. got bored of it, but I guess, yeah. you know, if they're literally saying that America has concentration camps and we all know the, what that term means and how explosive it is, mm -hmm. maybe, it, maybe it hasn't calmed down. What, as to what they'll do after 2020, I mean, they'll riot in the streets again and it may be worse than last time. I don't know. I, I, I would hope it would have calmed down and they would have that self-realization whereby, oh no, we actually have to have a policy platform that engages with millions of Americans. We can't just scream orange man bad all day. That's not going to get us the result we want. But they haven't learned that lesson yet. So who knows? who knows? Right, exactly. All right. Well, we wrap every episode by allowing you to leave a two minute message with the world. If you could say anything that you would want, <laughs> no, you have to do it, that you just would want to no take pressure. a hold in society. Just listen, everyone in the entire world, because that's how many people watch my show, the whole world, by the way. Okay. Right. Um, you look at that camera. And you can say whatever you want. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, world, here is Paul Joseph Watson. I'm glad I planned this out before. I would just encourage everyone, free speech is the foundational, the fundamental protection that we have in society. It guarantees absolutely everything. You need to support the people who are being targeted. You need to support Candace Owens. You need to support, yes, Alex Jones. And you need to support... Um, everyone who's been targeted by this wave of censorship because if free speech goes it all goes we found out throughout history first they take away your right to dissent your right to complain that's happened it's happening now in other authoritarian countries in China they have this giant sprawling social credit score system which is denying people the basic right to travel to engage in commerce and to engage in free speech and that is coming to the west and we live in a very dark hysterical time where we have empowered mobs of uh, outraged hysterical individuals who have contrived fake moral panics about things that aren't really a threat like nazis taking over society to enrich themselves with the very worst kind of authoritarian power which they're now imposing on everyone else and i think we've entered a very dark time in terms of free speech so we need to rally harder behind the fundamental fundamental principles of free speech more than ever before that's what i would say perfect okay. timing because they just started they just started drilling yep that's a wrap that was awesome that was actually a really good message to the world Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.